halfway through, that's not a problem. We'll be able to pick up on any details a bit later. So tonight our talk is on turbocharging your beet and brassica crops. And there's a touch on elms, as I mentioned earlier, and a mid-tier scheme. The mid-tier scheme has recently reopened for this year. I think it may be the last year for it. Uh, we're aiming to start in a few minutes. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Please, can you ensure you're muted, which is on the top right hand side of your screen? There should be a little symbol, looks like a microphone. Click on that till there's a cross through it. And um, please click on the little camera symbol so there's a cross through that as well, or a line through that, as you want your picture appearing all the way through the meeting. Uh, this hopefully stops or everyone talking on top of each other. We're going to take questions through the course of the evening. So if you look again at the top of your screen, you should see a symbol with two little people on there and to the right of that symbol is a little pop out uh, symbol like a speech mark. If you click on that, that should allow you to type in the right hand side of your screen any questions you want to type in. The more questions we get, the better. I'm sure, our speaker will be really pleased to answer as many as you can. Um, so we've got a few topics, just a quick one. We've got a few topics coming forward in a, a few weeks time. One is going to be on herbal lays. We've got some other animal health related topics as well so keep tuned to the rm jones website which has just been updated and also our facebook site for more information so i'm going to pass you over to brian copestake in a minute brian uh, has been works for lima grain up in the east of england he's been there for seven or eight years uh, before that he worked for advanta seeds and has worked in the agricultural supply trade for quite a long time i think since the mid 1980s after graduating from Newcastle University back in 1983. So, Brian, without much further ado, I'm going to pass over to you if that's okay. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes just to uh, load the PowerPoint. Not a problem at all. So, whilst Brian's doing that, we'll just have a quick mention about uh, the weather changing for those of you guys who've got crops in the ground or have got grassland. The weather looks like it's changing next week. It may well be worth if you've got some fertilizer to get some fertilizer on, or if you haven't got your fertilizer ordered up, keep looking at it. The prices are starting to move upwards quite a lot more now. I think they're projected to go up a couple of seven to ten quid next week. So it's all getting a bit expensive out there on the fertilizer side. So it may well be worth talking to either your agronomist or one of our guys or into one of the farm centers. Brian, looks like you're up together. I think it's on the screen now. Yeah, um, to go through, yes, if you want to put the questions onto um, the chat, uh, that's fine. Uh, I'll try and answer them at the end. If I can't, um, if you keep a record of them, John, then uh, I can always come back uh, when I have found out what the answer is. Okay, no problem at all. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, just show you what you've let yourselves in for. Um, have a look at the, uh, the forage crop. So anything that is basically not grass or maize. Um, so have a look at the, the different yields you can get from these crops and then we'll focus on a little bit more because we've got some new varieties, some new things going on in fodder beet, kale. We've got a new brassica called Skyfall that we're quite uh, pleased about. Uh, a bit of an update on stubble turnips. We've got some new forage rapes. Uh, just a reminder on how good Swedes are. Then a bit really um, just about on the movement from countryside stewardship to elms. And whilst we don't know the details of elms, we do know the detail of countryside stewardship and we know roughly where they're going with the elms um, proposition. Um, so we'll talk about that at the end. So uh, the first bit, just a little bit of history really and uh, some acreage figures, sorry, hectares. So if you go back to um, 2000, um, there are about 60,000 hectares of brassicas and fodder beet. Uh, we're currently in 2020. Uh, last year, the DEFRA census was 112,000. And our prediction is that within the next four years, we'll be about 120,000 hectares, which is twice what it was 24 years ago. And we think there's several reasons for that. Uh, one is obviously within that period, there's been quite a growth in AD. And AD do use uh, fodder beet in some of their plants. There's also, of course, been the introduction of uh, cover crops. Quite a few of those are brassicas or contain brassicas. That's been another part. And you can see on the graph there, there was quite a steep rise in 2018, the year we had the drought. And I think quite a few people moved into brassicas then, uh, saw some advantages and really didn't go back. 
Um, so we think that again, because of the lack of chemistry, which again we could, we'll talk about a bit later, lack of seed treatments, that sort of thing, <clears throat> it's actually getting quite difficult to um, go from permanent pasture back into a grass reseed without getting nailed by leather jackets, wild worm and everything else. So it's making a lot of sense to have more rotational farming and to go into brassicas, which are not host for these species, as an entry back into grass. So that really explains um, why we think the acreage will continue to expand. Just having a, a, a quick look, a bit reminder of um, the different crops. Uh, these are the main ones we're going to talk about uh, this evening. Uh, so there's fodder beet there, we've got sowing date, we've got the cost per hectare, and the yields, dry matter yield, protein, and energy content. And you can see that while fodder beet is, well, more than three times the cost of a lot of the other uh, brassicas there, the yields are phenomenal and the protein and the ME yields are also uh, very high. Now below that we've got kale, we'll talk about these in a bit more detail, but kale has dropped back a bit in acreage over the years, mainly I think because of problems with establishment. Um, but if you look there, um, if you just remember that the yield of kale is about eight to ten tonnes per hectare dry matter, and if you look at stubble turnips and forage rate which are below that, they're about uh, four to five tonne. Um, so we'll come back to those figures a bit later in the presentation. Now, Swedes, again, the acreage has gone down a bit, um, but again, very high energy product. Forage rye, we won't uh, touch on that very much in the presentation, apart from being in the rotations. But you can see there that um, actually the yield of forage rye is very good because it, it tends to be sown quite late in the autumn and used very early in the spring. So it's growing on a lot of other things are <laughs> probably not. And while it's protein and energy might not be very exciting, it is a brilliant feed uh, for dry cows and, and that sort of livestock. OK, so going on to fodder beet, and we've got a new variety called Fossima. Don't know who comes up with the names, but there we go. Uh, so we've got three beets here we're looking at really for forage. I'm not going to talk about AD uh, this evening. Um, Robos, I think, is the biggest selling beet for the forage market. Um, high yielding, been around for a few year, years. It's got a great shape to it. It's not fangy like some of the higher dry matter um, fodder beets, which are more akin to sugar beet. So it doesn't hold the dirt, so the soil tear is pretty low. Sits out in the ground quite well, so it's easy to harvest uh, with a leaf lifter. So Robos is probably number one at the moment. Uh, to the right of that is Blaze. Um, now Blaze is very popular for grazing in situ. We send a, a lot of Blaze down to New Zealand each year. And you saw the cost of uh, fodder beet in an earlier slide. And a lot of that is down to harvesting, storage and feeding out. And of course, if you graze it in situ, the cost of fodder beet suddenly uh, reduced dramatically. And Blaze, because it's very clean, sits out the ground well, is a great one. Uh, for grazing in situ. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, which brings me to one on the left, which is Fosima. As you can see, it sits out the ground really well and is a great shape. So again, it doesn't uh, tend to uh, attract too much soil to it. So uh, I said some of this about grazing the fodder beet in New Zealand. Um, quite often, of course, fodder beet, because of the energy density of the feed, um, if you're thinking about dry cows um, or replacement heifers, they can actually put on too much weight. So, and usually just to balance the diet, you need more fiber. So you'll be using uh, straw or silage in the field, depending on what sort of performance uh, you want to get from the animals that are grazing. Uh, any uh, changes for any animal, of course, in terms of diet should be gradual. And if you do that, there'll be no problem with grazing fodder beet. And I just put in there the Robos and Blaze, so you can see that they've got a good percent of the root above the ground. And just to make the comparison, I put in there Brick, another fascinating named uh, variety. Um, but that's a high dry matter one, and you can see there's not much root above the ground. And that's one of the ones we sell primarily into the AD market. But that one, it does obviously attract quite a lot of uh, dirt to the root. So it does need to be washed and chopped uh, before it is used. Uh, so coming on to uh, Fosima, uh, although it's got a, a green skin, 
uh, when you slice through it, it is a very attractive rose colour. So I said, the, the soil tear is low. And one of the things I really like about it is that there is very resistant to bolting. Because uh, from the bolting point of view, uh, there's nothing more depressing than seeing a field of fodder beet with hundreds or sometimes thousands of bolted plants. Because if you ever want to grow beets in that field again, you've got to get rid of them all, which means weed wiping, cutting or pulling them out by hand. <clears throat> so there's lots of reasons to uh, have a look at Fosima and, and that is one of them. I've got a, a yield chart in a second, but the yield is good. It's uh, above uh, terrine, one of its uh, uh, fellow beets in the market. Good resistance to powdery mildew and the dry matter is good. So when we look at um, this chart, on the horizontal axis, you can see dry matter percentage. So you go to the far right, you've got one like KWS Cindy, to Dawn and the brick that I mentioned earlier. Very high dry matter beets, sit long way in the ground, AD market. Uh, the vertical axis is dry matter yield, so you can see that generally speaking, it is these higher dry matter beets that have the high yield. There's a couple right out there on the left, Brigadier and Feldhair, very soft beets. Um, again, they can be grazed by, grazed by broken mouth ewes, all that sort of stuff, very soft beets. But you can see there that Fosima sits in that bracket between 20 and 22 percent dry matter where Robos and Terrine live and the yield is really good. So we've got high hopes for that variety. And if you are growing beets, um, if you can get hold of some of that seed for this year and see how it performs on your farm, uh, we would be very interested in the feedback. A little bit about seed treatments. Um, it's just really to make you aware um, that whilst we have force and tachygarian and, and vibrance that we can put onto the beet, and all three of those treatments go onto the, the blaze, the fosima, um, and the robos. The thing is that most of those are dealing with uh, the diseases and some of the pests, but the pests they don't really tackle are the aphids, um, and that has been the issue really. I guess it's more of an issue in sugar beet where you've got large acreage of, of beet um, in a relatively small geographical area and you do get quite a lot of aphid transmission um, and there is a bit of problem with that. Um, John can probably tell you but I think there's only uh, you only have one spray of aphids during the year so it is quite difficult to control them. You just need to bear that in mind um, but if you're grazing fodder beet and you haven't got a lot of other people with beet near you you may well not have a problem with aphids. Uh, I was just going to mention the seed priming. Um, all of the sugar beet seed is primed, but very little of the fodder beet is. Um, and we do prime some each year. We haven't got a lot left this year, I must admit. Um, but we look look at it on uh, Brick and Robos. We've got a bit left of that at the moment. I'll just tell you what the seed priming is and the advantages and disadvantages. And it might be something you want to bear in mind for the future. So. The process is that you take the seed and you soak it to the point where the enzymes in the seed are activated. So the seed is getting ready to germinate. You then dry it down and in that format it is then deemed as primed. So that when it's sown it's already got a head start. So if you're sowing into cold seed beds or uneven uh, seed beds or dry, the seed should all germinate at the same time and you'll get a higher rate of germination to get more plants per hectare. Uh, it does germinate three or four days sooner, which does reduce a little bit the window of opportunity for pests and diseases. But one of the other advantages is that all the plants will be at the same growth stage, which makes it easier to apply ag chem if the ag chem has to be applied at a certain uh, leaf stage or growth stage. And also when you come to harvest, the, the beet will be of a more even size so harvest, storage and feed out should all be easier. And all that just for uh, £10 a unit, £10 an acre. Um, the downside, I suppose, is apart from the £10, is that if you're not putting it into a cold, dry, uneven seedbed, uh, you won't see any difference. It will germinate anyway. And I would encourage people not to drill fodder beet into cold seedbeds because that is what will give you um, bolting issues. So. If you have a cold March, you're much better off to leave drilling your fodder beet until April. Um, it'll get away quicker and you'll have much less issues with 
bolting. OK, so moving on to kale. Uh, just a quick chat on variety selection. Uh, we've got quite a few varieties and with kale it's really simple and it's done on height. So if you're feeding short animals, i.e. sheep and lambs, you go for short kale, which would be keeper and pinfold. And if you're feeding tall animals, you obviously go for tall cows like Caledonian, Grampian and Bombardier. Um, I've got a picture somewhere, but unfortunately I couldn't find it, of some sheep in a crop of Caledonian, which was somewhere between five and six foot tall. And the poor sheep were wandering around amongst the stems, way below the leaves, wondering what they're meant to be eating. So it's a height thing, really. Uh, but the one I wanted just to focus on was Bombardier. So all these kales are marrow stem kales. So there's a lot of feed value within the stem. And if animals are not used to eating kale stems, sometimes they're quite shy of them. And so you come to move the animals from the field, they've eaten all the leaf, but the stems are left in the field, which is obviously quite a waste. So the idea with Bombardier is that it's been bred with less fibre in the stem, so it's got a higher digestibility in the stem. Not only does this give it a higher feed value, but also, of course, it makes it far more attractive um, to, for the animals to eat them. And in our demo site, which I mentioned right at the end out uh, near Newark, uh, if people come there, we invite them, take a knife and we invite them to choose some Bombardier and choose some Caledonian, and you can tell the difference yourself. So if you can tell the difference, I'm sure the sheep can. Another good thing about Pomadeer, it is also uh, tolerant to most of the club root strains, which obviously is quite handy. Uh, then I want to talk to you about uh, Skyfall. Uh, we've named this a bounce back brassica. You'll, you'll see the reasons in a minute. So Skyfall is a leafy brassica and it's got large strap leaves which have got very much the appearance of a stubble turnip leaf but there's no bulb on it, it is just leaf and root, there is no bulb. But the root is more akin to that of forage rape, so it's a deeper root, more fibrous, so good at penetrating the soil, so we've got plans perhaps of using this in soil improvement mixtures and cover crops, that sort of thing. Um, but it does mean that we can get some good regrowth from Skyfall, and it does do well in dry soil, dry situations. So just to give you a bit of background on the sowing, uh, the seed rates are quite low, it's only five kilos per hectare. Uh, we've got a startup seed treatment on there, which is basically seaweed extract which gives it a few of the trace elements to help establishment. Um, I'm sure you all do but every time you're sowing something new into the field it's a good idea to make sure you know what the soil indices are um, because very few of the seeds that we sell do well in pHs that are below six. Uh, Triticale might be one exception uh, but you really need uh, six plus to get a good result from any of these crops. And um, Skyfall, we'll go into a bit more detail. There's all sorts of ways it can be um, used in a rotation. So after first cut silage, cultivation, slot seeding, direct drilling, all that sort of thing is possible. OK, <laughs> it establishes quickly. Um, it only takes about five to seven days to get up and going. And it only takes about another five to seven weeks um, to produce enough forage to be grazing. So in 2020, in our demonstration plots, uh, we averaged about six weeks from sowing um, to grazing the crop. What we need to do on the, to get the, the bounce back and get the second grazing is to leave a good stubble. So there's still some uh, leaf to intercept sunlight, so get some photosynthesis. And you also need to put a bit of nitrogen on, 30 to 35 kilos nitrogen per hectare to make sure it gets going again. So say about 10, 10 centimetres is the height, so you can get some uh, bounce back regrowth. And of course, you can use an electric fence to control how much is being grazed and to make sure that the area is allowed to recover. So just to give you an example. 
Uh, so in one of our trials, we sowed it towards the end of May. We allowed five to seven weeks growth period, uh, which took us somewhere near mid-July. We then had the first graze. Then it was given four to six weeks rest with nitrogen so it can bounce back again. Again, we went through in August, grazed it again, another period to bounce back and then had a third grazing. So you can get three bites of the cherry. So this is just a picture there. Uh, we actually in our trial site, because it's over um, in Nottinghamshire, we don't actually have any animals. So we have to do our grazing with a machine, uh, very much similar to the way that um, BSBB and NIAB do it with the, uh, the grass trialling. So what I wanted to show you here was, if you cast your mind back uh, to the second or third slide this evening, um, we looked at the yield of forage rate and stubble turnips, and it was around the four, four and a half ton per hectare mark. Now here, with our first grazing, we got three and a half. Second grazing, we got nearly three. Third, we got about one and a half. And we had a fourth grazing, where again, we got about one and a half. So in total, we got up to about nine and a half tons per hectare. So by sowing this crop early and grazing it, and allowing it to recover, we've actually got some really decent yields out of it. And you have to bear in mind that the site we use, it's uh, on an arable farm. Uh, the soil doesn't get any uh, farmyard manure, and I would expect over in the west, uh, where you guys are, uh, with better soils, more fertile soils, uh, you would get higher yields than those. Just in terms of the feed quality, uh, dry matter content, 11, 12%. The ME is 10, which is good. It's not fantastic like the Swedes or the fodder beet, but it's a good ME for a brassica. And, but the protein level is really good. So 16 to 18% proof protein. So just to say about the rotations, because we've already talked about um, breaking the, the pest and disease cycle between grass lays. And if you use this uh, Skyfall bounce back brassica, you can do that and you can give your grass a good break and then go back in either late that autumn or the following spring. But you don't have to go back into a grass reseed. You might want to go into forage rye, as I mentioned earlier, because you can drill that um, as late as October without any problems at all. Or you might want to go into uh, a winter cereal. OK, we've got some information on it, so if you want to see a little video, we've got that on our website, as well as a grower's guide and some technical trial data, some of which you've just seen, of course. OK, that was the skyfall. Quick look at stubble turnips. Uh, we haven't got anything really uh, new here. Uh, stubble turnips are really divided on uh, on crop type really. So the, for the sheep and the lambs, we've got um, Samson Delilah, which are tankard shaped stubble turnips. And for the dairy and the beef, we've got Typhon, uh, which is a stubble turnip uh, without really much of a root at all, just very leafy. And also we've got Rondo, which is a, a more rounded um, stubble turnip, more suitable really for the dairy and the beef. OK, moving on to forage rape. Again, we've got a bit of a split here, um, but these forage rate three are quite interchangeable. There's a couple of new ones I want to talk to you about, one in which is Rampart and one called Unicorn. Um, but we have Interval and Hobson, which have been the, uh, the stalwarts uh, for quite a few years now. Uh, we sell a lot of Interval and Hobson, again, uh, that is very good with winter hardiness, so it depends where you are. If you want winter hardiness, it's Hobson. Uh, for that and that production, it has been interval. I'll tell you a bit more about Rampart in a second. Uh, it's interesting with the forage rate, uh, particularly with the interval. We have sold interval anywhere in the world from Iceland, where they now grow interval, right the way down to Zimbabwe. So we're exporting interval all the way around the world, really. But coming on to Rampart, um, again, we're looking at feed enhancements here. Can we breed something with more digestibility? Can we get more 
uh, metabolic energy out of these crops. So this one, uh, Rampart, it's got some good yield potential. Wind hardiness is good, which gives you obviously quite a lot more flexibility. Um, and like most of these stubble zones on forage rapes, it's ready to feed within 12 to 14 weeks. And of course, um, a lot of growers will mix the stubble turnips and the forage rape together. Uh, it makes the diet, I think, more interesting for the animals if they got a, a bit of variation in there. And also, if you plan to graze a little bit later, uh, the forage rape being more winter hardy than the stubble turnip will help protect the stubble turnips and keep them fresher and more attractive to the sheep for longer. OK, we've got a new hybrid rape um, called Unicorn. Now, it's a kale rape hybrid and it has got club root tolerance. But the good thing about this really is when we looked at the rapes right back at the beginning and we looked at the feed quality and the yields and all the rest of it, um, the average on the forage rate was an ME of between 10 and 11. And here we've got unicorn at 11.2. So it's a significant improvement in quality and energy. And as you know, energy is very expensive and 11 ME is far superior to something of 10. It's also got a, a good yield. The yield is 11% greater than the controls, which is uh, a cross between the interval and the uh, Hobson yield. So we've got a very high energy yield per hectare, 12.4% um, dry matter. And the other thing we just noted in our trials in 2018, um, they got a right hammering in the drought. Uh, but Unicorn looked tremendous. It looked really well in the drought. So if you've got light fields or areas prone to drought, uh, Unicorn is the forage rate for you. Uh, this is just really a quick reminder on Swedes, really. Um, not much new in the Swede market. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the market is declining a bit, really. Uh, the culinary market has fallen, so the, the acreage of Swedes in Scotland has dropped somewhat. And uh, it has done the same, really, um, across England and Wales. It's a bit of a shame, really, because as you saw at the beginning, the, the energy level in the Swedes is really high. Uh, the yields are good, as you can see there. Um, and we've got a couple of really nice ones there, Gowry and Lomond, because not only are they very high yielding, but they've got great uh, mildew resistance. Um, and the shape is good, which is obviously important if you're going to uh, market them as a culinary Swede. Just the other thing to note about Swedes is their winter hardiness. Because the, the sugar in Swede is hexose rather than dextrose, it gives them a huge edge. And I don't know if you recall the very cold winter of uh, 2010. Um, with that, nearly everything was just destroyed. So the forage rate, uh, the kales, they got frozen. And when they defrosted, they just went to a mush. Um, but with the Swedes, because of the way that their, their sugar is constructed, which is different to the sugar in fodder beet, uh, they maintain their winter hardiness much better. So probably why they're so popular, of course, in Scotland. Uh, we do have quite a lot of um, literature. We've got our essential guide to forage crops, which you can download from the website. Uh, we've got really everything you need to know about uh, brassicas and fodder beet. Uh, that guide only comes out uh, every alternate year. Um, and if we have any other trial data or updates, again, we put them on these technical sheets, which again on the website. OK, um, I don't know if there's any guys involved with shoots, but just uh, a little bit of an issue. We have a game cover maze at the moment. This is a uh, one of the fallout from Brexit. It's no longer legal to bring anything, any variety of any crop into the UK unless it's on the UK national list, our seeds catalog, if you will. Um, and with Game Cover Maze, what we used to do, we used to bring over um, varieties from France uh, where we, <coughs> we thought they might have a surplus of those varieties, and we sow them out in our um, Game Cover trials and we work out the standing ability because you've got completely different objectives, of course, for game cover maize because you want the thing to be standing in maize, sorry, in uh, January, and uh, you don't want it too high and you want it winter hardy. 
Uh, but we can't do that anymore. So gain cover means this year is already quite short. Um, if you need to look at alternatives, an obvious one is actually just use forage maize. Cost you more money, but of course we'll do can do a similar job. But you need to, you to pick one that's late because it's more likely to stand um, and still be viable uh, come January. But there are other options, of course. Um, if you're on a favourable site, you can use sorghum. We've got uh, dwarf, intermediate and uh, giant sorghums, all of which are good replacements for maize. Uh, the WBSM, that's the wild bird seed mixtures, which we'll talk about in a minute uh, in relation to countryside stewardship. They can be used as a replacement for game cover maize, and of course you get paid for those. Other things like chicory. But if you're on a colder site, whether it's because of altitude or you're north facing or, or etc., um, and you can't use sorghums, of course you can use kale. Uh, kale used to be the mainstay of, uh, of shoots. And we've got a mixture called Labrador. Um, we've named quite a few of our mixtures after dogs. Um, but again, that one is uh, for northern climates and more challenging climates. And a lot of those options actually are better for uh, the pheasants, the partridges, and for the, basically the environment in general. OK. Uh, moving on to countryside stewardship. There's quite a lot of information, of course, um, on the DEFRA sites. But this is something I've just I've just picked out a few things here, really. Um, some of which you may well know, of course. But it is still worth well worthwhile considering moving into countryside stewardship now, if you're not in it, rather than waiting for elms. Because it's a great way to prepare for elms and it's going to reward you in the meantime. So although there's a pilot being rolled out now in 2021, uh, the Elms is not going to be fully functioning until 2024. And of course, in the meantime, uh, the basic payment is going to be reduced. So we just have a look at countryside stewardship as it stands now. Um, well, sorry, just for that, I'll just go through some of the principles of Elms. Uh, we had a presentation from Anderson's a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I've just copied two or three of their slides um, just to show basically how it's thought it's going to work. So they were going to call them tiers, but because of uh, COVID, they thought tiers wasn't very good. So they're going to call the components now. There's basically three. So the Elms is going to be made up of a, a sustainable farming incentive, which is going to be broad and shallow into which uh, most farmers should be able to participate. There's going to be local nature recovery scheme, which is enhanced land management, and we can touch on that. And the third bit is a landscape recovery scheme, and this is more uh, of a complex use, change of use really. Um, so going into afforestation, peat restoration, etc. So we won't be covering that this evening. Uh, obviously, they are expecting an awful lot of people to participate in this, um, and whilst the aspiration is to pay on outcomes not actions uh, the thinking is that might be rather tricky so if for example um, you're going to be paid on the number of skylarks how do you know how many you had to start with and how do you count the ones you currently got and how do you know whether they're yours or your neighbors so it may well default to a menu of pounds for practices which is how the current countryside stewardship scheme works Um, this was really saying that um, it's going to be a menu based scheme and they'll be grouped into packages. So there'll be things like the countryside wildlife offers, which are ones will interest uh, me as, as a seed company. Um, it gives you the phases there, but the full scheme doesn't really launch until 2024. Okay. The local nature recovery scheme, this builds on existing countryside stewardship. Another good reason to get involved in stewardship now. And it's rewarding land managers for positive management, whether it's biodiversity, carbon storage, flood management, or whatever it may be. Um, if it's going to be whole farm plans, it will probably be uh, advisor led. Uh, so somebody like Anderson's would be the people to lead you through and make sure uh, the forms, and everything else are done correctly. So your scheme would be accepted. OK. So what are the options until Elms in 2024? 
Um, oh, yeah, sorry, John, of course, Orin Jones, agronomist. Um, there's mid-tier, higher-tier and the wildlife offers. Now, with the mid-tier, there's a range of uh, options, which we look at very briefly. Higher tier is quite specialised. Um, so it's going to be around SSIs and things like that. So again, we won't really be looking at that this evening. But it's the wildlife offers which are open to everybody and are relatively straightforward. So that's what we're going to have a look at now. So if you look at this, which I took straight off the, uh, I think it's the National England website. If you just have a look at the, the top line there, where it says funding type. So the higher tier and the mid tier are competitive. In other words, just because you put your bid in doesn't mean it's going to be accepted. Whereas the wildlife offers, which are based broken down into four, arable, mixed farming, lowland and upland, they're non-competitive. In other words, if you fill the forms out properly, you will be accepted and you will be paid. There's also other stuff on hedgerows, boundaries and woodland management, but that's not seed, so I won't be talking about those. OK, so we just have a look at uh, each one, just to give you an idea of what's involved and, and how much you get paid. So for the lowland offer, so if it's a lowland farm, um, there's seven options and those seven options are in three different categories. And all we have to do is pick one option from category one and one from category two. Oh, sorry, one option from category one and two. So in category one, there's only two options. So it's permanent grassland with very low inputs, and it's GS4, which is the legume and herb rich swords, which I think I heard John say you're going to have a separate meeting on at another date. But if you go for those legume and herb rich swords in countryside stewardship, these are payment of £309 per hectare. But you do need to put a minimum of 2% of the farmland into that scheme. That's what it looks like. That's the GS4. In the arable offer, there's 11 options in three categories, and you must pick at least one from each category. So in category one, the category one is basically pollen and nectar. So there's two options, and they're called AB1 and AB8. One is a nectar flower mix, uh, something like bee mix, um, which is very simple, things like phacelia, um, bird's foot trefoil, that sort of thing. And the other one is the flower rich margins, which is grass and flowers mixed. And you can see the payments there, £511 a hectare and £539 a hectare. Now, of course, you do have to dis deduct your establishment costs from that figure. But if you establish these things properly, they will both last easily the five years of your agreement. So you've only got the establishment costs once, and then that is your payment per hectare. And I had a trawl through John Nix the other night, and it seems to me that there's um, a lot of bits in various different farms where you're going to struggle to make that sort of money unless you're in uh, first wheats and you're in the best bit of your field. So the payments actually aren't that bad. Uh, category two, there's only one option. So that's really nice and simple. And it's called AB9. Basically, it's a, a winter bird food mix. So uh, Say we name some vans after dogs, we've got one called Jack Russell, which contains things like sunflowers, millet, sorghum, stuff like that. Uh, another one called Bird Feeder, uh, we've got linseed in it again, uh, Aussie radish, mustard, millet blend. Um, and there's the 2WBF, which is the two year wild bird feed mixture. Um, and this contains actually quite a lot of kale, that's how you get your second year. And we've got specialist ones such as uh, linnet and bunting. So with these, um, the payment is higher. Uh, things like the Jack Russell, you'd have to establish every year. But obviously things like the two year wild bird feed mixture, one establishment cost two years. And again, if, you, if you're running a shoot, this one is a real no brainer because um, these are very attractive to uh, pheasants and partridges. Now, category three, there's eight options. Um, there's one which involves uh, seeds, so I've put that one there. And that is basically um, buffer strips on cultivated land. So you do something like basic habitat, which is coxfoot, etc. 
Um, so you've got some grasses in there, some fescues. So again, if you establish that well in year one, you've got that for the full five years. So that is the arable offer. That's what the bee mix looks like. You can see the red clover there, and you can see the phacelia, and you can see uh, the vetch right in the foreground. Uh, that's the Jack Russell. Obviously, the sunflowers are done really well in that particular uh, plot, and you can see the millet poking through at the bottom. Uh, that's the basic habitat. You can see some of the cocks there, top right of the picture. Um, then we come to the mixed farming offer. Uh, there's 14 options in this one, again in uh, three categories, and you just got to pick at least one from each category. I focus on the, the seed related ones, but in category one, there's three options. And again, this one's all about pollen. So you can pick bee mix or flower rich margins, any of those sorts of ones, same as before. Category two is the same. Again, it's all about uh, the birds, this one, so bird food. And again, category three, very similar. It's all about stopping nutrients moving away <coughs> or ag chem or anything else moving off from where it should be and using buffer strips to hold the nutrients, the soil or whatever it is, where you want it to be. And that's basic habitat. Uh, that's what the flower rich margin looks like. You can see quite a lot of birds for trefoil in that particular picture. Uh, just mentioned Glastier briefly because I know you're there on the Welsh border. Um, it's far more straightforward than the, the English versions. Um, but as you probably know, if you're involved in it, it's a five year whole farm scheme. Uh, there's three sections, the entry advance and the common. And there's a range of options in there. So it can be retaining winter stubbles, uh, establish an unsprayed root crop, which is obviously where we sow quite a lot of our Swedes, main crop turnips and indeed stubble turnips. Establishing a wildlife cover crop, and that can either be any of those pollen and nectar mixtures or any of the uh, wild bird seed mixtures, and the unharvested cereal headland. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the uh, catalogue that we use. Uh, this is new for uh, 2021, and it has all the conservation and game cover crops in there. It has a chart which gives you all of the, the numbers, the AB9s, the SW4, the whole lot is in there, so you can see exactly what you have to do. And my last slide really is just to mention our innovation site and our trial site. Fortunately, it's not terribly close to you. It's at um, Newark near Nottinghamshire, a little village called Brent Brute. But we've been there for several years and we're trying all sorts of things there. So when we get a new um, kale or fodder beet or whatever it may be out the breeding program, this is for it is where it's first trial. Um, obviously, some things fail, uh, some things work, uh, a bit of trial and error involved, uh, but we keep the things going and we're producing a lot of interesting material from there. We can also uh, do quite a lot of different trials. So, for example, on stubble turnips and forage rape. Uh, we've been trialing different seed rates because we have noticed over the years that the, the quality of the drills has improved. Um, the quality of the seed has probably improved. Uh, and actually now with uh, good agronomy and all the rest of it, people are actually using lower seed rates than they were, say, five, ten years ago. So we've been looking at that. Uh, we've also been looking at sequential sowing. I, what effect does the date you sow have on what you get? Because the things like stubble turnips and forage rape, which are often sown um, after harvest to try and get something at the end of the season, um, we can demonstrate how critical it is to try and get those sowings in early. Stubble turnips, for example, if you sow them a bit late, you'll get the leaf, but you're not going to get any bowl. So we can do all that sort of thing down at our, our innovation site, and uh, you're more than welcome there at any time. So um, if RM Jones would like to arrange a trip out there, we'd be more than happy to see you. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. That was uh, very informative. There's lots of information in there. Um, a few questions have come up. Uh, a couple of them came on a text, so I've typed those in there. Uh, one of them was going back to Swedes. Obviously, the energy content of Swedes is very high and they're, they're relatively straightforward to establish. Quite a lot of people are uh, directing them into a spray wall. But what sort of protein content would you expect from Swedes? OK. Yeah, well, Swedes aren't brilliant. Um, I'll just see if there's much variation between them, really. 
10 to 11 percent protein on the sweets right okay so it's not it's not going to set the world alight then but as a an energy crop it's it's great it's just lots of energy ideal for finishing stock yeah that's it it's an energy feed not, not a protein feed yeah definitely okay um second one that came in uh, as well which was when you're talking about sky four brassicas someone commented um can you can you use that as an autumn sown crop do you get the same sort of effect with a bit of uh, grow back as long as you don't graze it too hard it's a very good question uh, the answer is we don't know but we're trying it we're doing exactly that um, so we are going to um, drill out some skyfall um, this autumn and see how it goes through I mean I think I suspect it'll grow quite well but the, a lot of these things uh, when they get into the winter they do get quite a lot of disease um, so th there could be mildew or dreschler going in there so um, it depends what they want to do it for. I think if you wanted to sow it in the autumn with a view to grazing something in the spring, I think you'd probably be out of luck. But if you wanted something in there as a soil conditioner, a sort of green cover, that sort of thing, and you were just going to plough it in anyway, I think, yes, that could, that could be a, a goer. Yeah. I suppose the other, the other thing, when in you're saying your trials, they are, uh, you're, you top them off or you control them mechanically, and the, over this side, they get grazed, and with the winter like we're having at the moment, or have up until now, and last winter poaching can be quite an issue if you're not careful so i suppose treading them in could be quite a challenge but i know there are people who have been double grazing forage crops locally and they seem to be getting away with it and it's working quite successfully so if there was an option to do that and it did work that might be quite interesting if it's bred purely for that well purely yeah, bred for that line really that could be yeah, a good thing yeah some of these brassica crops um particularly with the thinking about sort of the public image and all the rest of it, it does help if there's a grass run back so the animals don't get too dirty. And it's particularly the case with, um, you know, cattle grazing fodder beet. They need somewhere to go back to, really. Otherwise, uh, you get animals up to the hocks in mud and complaints, etc. Yeah, yeah, there's that's there's a lot of people looking over hedges and seeing things and sometimes they don't like what they see. But I know what you mean. Um, another question came in is when it comes back to stubble turnips, What's the latest you can successfully plant stubble turnips? Well, you can't you can plant them quite late, but you just don't get much of a bulb. So uh, in the trials that we did, we looked at sowing really uh, from beginning of July, middle of July, end of July, um, and then into into August. And the size of the, the bulb just goes from, you know, if you, the early sowings, they, they be as big as your fist and the later sowings, they're no bigger than a pencil. So I think if you're getting into um, later sown stubble turnips, I think you're better off with forage rate. And you that's might, much difference in yield, but the forage rate um, will tend to be more winter hardy because if you've sown it late, you're likely to be feeding it later. So you might be better off with the rate than the turnips. So is that, where some, of the high, turnip, yeah. sorry, is that where some of the hybrids might come in as well, where you might get a really decent yield off the back of them? Uh, for a later sowing rather than going for stubble turnips. I, I think that's spot on. That's spot on. Um, Carwin, one of my colleagues, has typed in. I think he's trying to find out a bit of extra information. Um, Fossima fodder beet, is there any prime seed still available? Because I know there was some available at, at one point, but it seems to have, well, we don't know if there's any left. Uh, I've got a feeling that we're getting very on this. I think, um, I think Fossima, the answer is no. I think there's about 15 units of robos and about 19 units of brick i think that's about it um right i'm afraid okay. with, the, with the prime is more of a pitch for next year than this year i'm afraid <laughs> right okay um i i had a question right early on which is my own one which was when it comes to fodder beet there's few people who agree using fodder beet in finishing rations now is there um is there a maximum inclusion rate you you'd be going to with fodder beet in a in a finishing ration yeah, there is, and it's not terribly high. Um, I might just have a look it up. The trouble is, if you feed too much beet, um, they can just get too much energy in there, and you can upset the room and function. So you've got to be careful on that one. Um, I'll look up the figure, and I'll let you know, but it, it's something range of sort of um, 10, 10, 15 kilos, something like that. I'll just check that one. But yes, you can't just go ad hoc on for a bit because you, you will run into issues. OK, so 
there is a limit. OK, no, that's fine. I can pass that one on to a few people who've asked me in the past. Um, another one just had it as a text is, is it better to mix species? I think they're meaning um, the kales and the, not the kales, the forage rapes and the stubble turnips um, for autumn feed rather than growing one or one or the other species. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you're going to um, graze them in the autumn, I would mix them. <clears throat> I think it makes it more interesting for, for the sheep if they're, if they're eating a mixture of crops. Um, I think it's just, you know, just one. Uh, they've, they've done a lot of trials on this, actually, with uh, dairy cows. Um, and the more different ingredients you put in the ration, the more interesting they find it, and the more they eat and the more performance you get. Um, and there's no reason to suppose any different with sheep. So I think if you mix the stubble turnips and the forage rate together, you'll get a higher intake than you will just having one or the other. And I suppose following on from that question that was asked is, um, are there any other species that we could be putting into some of these mixes to improve both uh, from an environmental aspect, sort of soil health, but from a livestock perspective, improve performance? So could we be putting some um, oats in there or would phacelia make a difference? Uh, various other various other more novel crops, would they make a difference or add anything to the mix? Um, I think some of the issues with some of this stuff is that if the two things are broadly similar, then it's fairly easy to manage them. So with forage rate and stubble turnips growing at the same rate, doing the same thing, you can mix them and, and there's nothing else to worry about. Um, it's the same with putting things sort of chicory into grazing mixes and things like that. It, it can work really well, but if the chicory gets away from you, it can be a problem to manage because, you know, yeah. use chicory as a game cover feed because it'll bolt. Um, so I think you've got to just think about, you know, the management of that. I and mean, it's the same with um, arable silage. Is it better to grow a field of peas and a field of um, barley or wheat and mix them in the clamp or mix them together in the field? I would imagine from a management point of view, you're probably better to grow them separately than mix them at the end. Um, so it's those sorts of considerations, really. Um, but I think we're going to be talking about it another time. But um, uh, these multi-species lays, um, yes, they they are a hot topic really, and they seem to be performing. You know, the the sum of the parts. Uh, sorry, the what you get from it is more than the sum of the parts. Yeah. Well, that's like I was saying earlier, and you commented in the evening. We, we're going to have another talk on um, diverse swords, herbal lays, multi-species lays in March which should hopefully be quite interesting. Hopefully get as many people there as we can to listen in on that one. That could be quite useful. I've um, I've not got any more questions come through. So if anyone's got any questions, then again, you can click on the uh, the pop out at the top of the screen, which looks like uh, a speech symbol. And then on the bottom right, you can type in a question. I'm sure there's there's plenty of questions out there just dying to be asked. So if you have any, please type them in there. And I'll uh, I'll hang on for a a minute or so until I've, I've got a question. I'm going to wait until I've got someone at least typing a question in. Oh, no, someone just left the meeting instead. <laughs> no, um, just one, of the one. Just in terms of are you seeing more people using brassicas in a rotation now? Is that is that happening in your part of the world? I think that this area seems to be quite They've been using brassicas in Herefordshire and the borders for a long time, but you do see it. Yeah, you see a lot around the place. So everyone is a lot of people are using them and maybe there are one or two people on who aren't. And it, this might give them some thoughts on how to use them more effectively in the system. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, from over in the east, obviously, you get big issues with flea beetle over there. Have you any thoughts or ideas or? What are people doing over there to manage flea beetle in beet crops or in uh, other forage crop, in other brassica crops over there? Um, not grow them is the easiest. Is the answer really? Um, we've been trying to grow uh, our seed crops of uh, forage rape in in, e in the east, and we've given up now. Um, so we're actually putting them out in your part of the world. So we think we've got more of a chance. Um, it is a problem, but you do seem to get. Um, problems with oh the one coming in on the yeah 50, well, yeah um so some years you get bad flea beetle years and others it's not it doesn't seem to be a problem um 
I'm involved in a in a little shoot. Um, unsurprisingly, I supply the game cover, and we've got around the problem with kale. Um, we sow a mixture out like a wild bird seed mixture, which has some kale in it, and we do that usual sort of time in sort of uh, May. And then I quite often go back in and just broadcast more kale on six, six, seven weeks later after flea beetle have hit it initially and we don't get a problem. It comes through a tree. So some of this stuff is about timing um, and also distractions. So we have been trying to look at um, uh, putting stubble turnips around some of these, these crops, but sometimes it's just the, the pure number. Um, you can try and put a, if you like, a sacrifice uh, area around your field, but if you've got billions of um, the pollen beetle, they just motor their way through the lot. The little buggers. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, well, the, the last question came in uh, from Andrew Powers. It's what's your thoughts on feeding lifted fodder beets to inland ewes? Yeah, again, uh, you, you need to have one that's a low, low dry matter one, something like the Blaze. Um, obviously, it doesn't work terribly well um, if they're broken mouth, but yeah, anything with decent, decent uh, teeth is going to get into the, the softer beets. Uh, I think you do just have to make sure that, again, you've got the balance right between uh, the fibre and the beet uh, to make sure that the, the energy density of the ration just isn't too high. Um, but yes, it's a great one for putting into there because um, huge energy density feed and the animals like it. There's no problem with the intake at all. In fact, that's one of the issues in, in a sort of feeding race or something that um, they will push each other out of the way to try and get in, eat the beet first. I suppose putting my nutrition hat on, the only thing you've got to make sure is that those those late gestation um, use very close to the lamb and they will need some decent protein in there, some uh, some natural protein with high DUP just to make sure they get milky and they're producing decent colostrum, which good to go with it. I think feeding purely uh, beet alone might or beet and forage alone might just struggle to get the milk in side of the ewes. Yeah, it is not not gain. It's, it's a lot of these crops uh, they tend to be brassicas, which are high in protein or um, the root crops, which are high in energy. Yeah. Um, and then Martin's come in and followed that one up with uh, Swedes turnips or fodder beet to graze use until lambing with no supplementary feeding and their Welsh use. Um, I, I chuck my head on in there, which is I can't see any issues with that at all. That would that would work quite well. But obviously later in the um, again, as I said, right at the very end, we probably need to make sure we've got a decent protein source going into that just to build up colostrums. But Brian, your talk, your thoughts. I think Swedes are great. I mean, for sheep. Um grazing Swedes going through you know, into the autumn winter I mean it's the perfect thing they're the right size the right shape the right sugar the really winter hardy yeah I, I would really bump for the Swedes I think uh, good thing about Swedes is they they are very low cost to to to, uh, to grow as well where you can just yeah. direct fill them into old sward and if you're in if you're in the other side of the border in Glastia that works really well uh, it works really well on this side of the border obviously as well but yeah, they do work quite well. Everyone I've seen is growing Swedes and where they're zero tilling them in, they, they seem to do it every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there's any other questions, please type them in there. But if you have any other questions that you can't think of this evening, pass them on to us either in the farm centres or to either Carwin, Jack or myself, if you see us about, or John Pask or anyone else that deals with our, is in RM Jones, and we'll do our best to answer them or we'll pass them back to Brian and do our best to answer them. Um, some of the literature... Some of the literature that was um, Brian posted up in his talk, we do have in the stores, so we can make that available if you want some of the yield data on different crops, some of the different varieties and species. Uh, we have all that sort of stuff. So just ask in the shops when you go in there next, and uh, I'm sure the girls will be able to, or anyone in the shops will be able to provide you with that information. Right, I don't think there's any other questions. Um, so. All I can say is thank you very much for tonight, Brian. Really appreciate that. There's lots of information in there. It's been really useful. I think the the Elm stuff, we haven't touched on that in the questions very much, but I think going forward, that's going to be quite important, making that transition across to it. Um, and so seeing different people try different things is going to be very useful for, for other people to plan as well going forward. So, yeah, that, that's been quite a really interesting, informative talk.
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Take care. Thanks for Thank listening. You. Um, we're going to have a couple more talks, as I said, in the next couple of months, uh, both the animal health and uh, a herbal lays meeting next month. So keep looking at the RM Jones website and on the RM Jones Facebook site for more information. And we will keep texting you out different bits here and there. Thank you very much, everyone. And so at that point, we're going to leave. Take care.